I made a new PCB design because I needed an accessory board with a bunch of peripherals to help make breadboarding a little easier. Despite my best efforts, everything is always a mess, so I may have a power supply kicking around, but I might have to dig it out. Good luck finding an LED or a potentiometer. And if I'm doing audio experiments, it'd be nice to have a little amplifier on standby. So I put together a list of all the things I thought would be convenient to have in one place, and I came up with this design. I ordered the boards from PCBWay, and in five days I had them in my hands. I called this one Breadboard Buddy, and this time I had some components that are so close together I could barely put reference designators, so I made the text font and line width as small as the minimum recommended by PCBWay's website, and it all came out legible, even though a little may be cropped here and there for the pads as needed. So let's start putting this together and look at the design. Today's video is sponsored by PCBWay. 10 PCBs for $5 plus shipping. They can support your prototyping, including advanced PCB needs. And if you're looking for more project ideas, you can look at the community on their website. You can browse other people's submitted designs, and some may have links to more information about their design, so you may find something interesting, inspiring, or directly usable. Go take a look at PCBWay.com. Here's the overall schematic. We basically have a power supply section here, an audio amplifier section here, and then some onboard LEDs and potentiometers for quick access, and some bi-directional level shifters. For the power supply, I have a standard 2.1 by 5.5 millimeter DC jack, which is very commonly used, and I don't have a power switch on this board. I figured if I wanted one, I could just get one of these inline power switches. I have so many wall adapters, and some of them are AC, some are DC, some have center positive or center negative polarity. So I wanted to just take whatever I can find and have it work fine as long as it can do enough current. So I'm coming into a full bridge rectifier, which will give me a known plus and minus polarity on the output for an AC in or for a DC in whether it's connected plus minus or minus plus. So this is much better than a puny single diode rectifier. So then I have a filter capacitor, so I'd have to do a better calculation later, but it's a placeholder part. The first thing I'm doing here is running this into a SEPIC converter. I will link to a few app notes about this topic. It's essentially a DC to DC converter where you design it for a certain output voltage and the input can be lower, the same, or higher than the output instead of a buck or boost only. And for this I'm using the XL6009 because I have some of those on hand. And this can take 5 volts to 32 volts in which is why I chose my input to be at least 7 volts, because then, by the time I lose some through a couple of diode drops, I should still have enough to run this converter at the lowest input. And also, I'm generally going to be working with lower voltages here, so the higher I have an input voltage, the more power dissipation I have to deal with, so I just chose 7 to 20 volts. Here's a SEPIC configuration for this regulator. There's standard input and output capacitors and a voltage divider to set the output target voltage. So if we keep the bottom resistor fixed at 1K and we use a potentiometer on the top, we can vary the output voltage and whatever it's set for, the input can vary above and below that and still give us this output. This one is showing a coupled inductor, but you can also do it with separate inductors. And that's what I've drawn here. And I don't want this output voltage to go below about 10, so I put a fixed resistor in series with the potentiometer, and it calculates out that I can adjust the voltage between 10.5 and 23. I'm calling this rail VSW for voltage of the switcher, and I also use it with several linear regulators to derive other DC rails. First I'm using an LM317, and with the potentiometer on here, I should be able to adjust this output called V adjust between about 1.25 volts and all the way up to a max of 19.5. The 317 needs up to 3 volts of dropout headroom, so that's where I start making my decisions about what I want each rail to be able to do. So this is just 
a spare adjustable regulator that I can have on hand. Here's a typical LM317 regulator circuit with a whole bunch of extra stuff, including these protection diodes. I put these footprints in, and it may allow me to do experiments with this at some point. For the bottom resistor, I have a 5K pot in parallel with a fixed 2.7K resistor. Because in order to get this 19.5 volts, I would need an obscure resistance value on the pot, but I have a 5K, so I tapered it down by putting another one in parallel. Then this V switcher rail also powers another LM317 circuit. I call this rail VCC positive, and I can adjust it from 1.5 volts up to 8.85. I can actually get it down to 1.25, but I called it 1.5 because it's also feeding into this ICL7660 negative voltage generator. 1.5 to 10 volts, or the A version can give you 1.5 to 12 volts. Converts your voltage supply from positive to negative. So this allows me to do a split rail plus and minus so I can power op amps and things like that. Then I take this positive VCC rail and I feed it into an LM1117 to generate 5 volts. And then I take that 5 volt rail and feed it into another to generate a 3.3 volt rail. What that means is, even though I can adjust VCC between 1.5 and 8.85, my intention is to keep this around plus and minus 7 to 9 volts, just to power op amps, but it has to be high enough to give me a 5 volt rail here, so I need 5 volts plus the dropout of this regulator. And because this project is supposed to be for convenience with breadboarding and not having to go running around looking for everything, for these three adjustable voltage rails, I'm using an ATtiny85 with voltage dividers so I can scale down these inputs into ranges between 0 and 5 and read them as analog inputs and then display those on a 128 by 64 OLED display with I squared C. Over on GitHub, I have the ATtiny85 Arduino sketch. This is similar to a recent project I did using ATtiny85 on Digispark. Here's a description of the calculations I'm doing to convert the actual 0 to 5 volt analog reading back into the actual voltage that I am measuring. The reading needs to be scaled back up to compensate for being scaled down by the voltage divider. So these are the two scaling factors I need to multiply various readings with and I'm printing out the scaled version of the analog input. I'll link to that original video below. I'm looking at the V switcher. The multimeter says 10.8 volts, and the Atmel chip is measuring, let's say, 11 volts. So that's within a couple percent, which is reasonable for what this circuit can do. And now if I adjust this to the maximum, I can get 24 volts out of this switcher, and the AT Tiny 85 tells me I got 24.6 or 7 volts. So that may be a little more error, but considering the measurement method, I'm using two resistors in a voltage divider, and I'm not sure if those are 1% resistors. They could even be 5%. This is just meant to be a ballpark, so I don't need to hook up a meter every time I'm changing this. Occasionally, there's some weird characters that get printed out. You only see them for a flash. There, it just happened. I'll ignore it for now. Maybe I can figure it out later. This rail, called V-Adjust, I put it at minimum. I'm measuring 1.2. 246. The AT-Tiny says 1.22, so that's pretty good. And when I go to the maximum, I can get 19.04, and here it shows 19.40. Now looking at this rail called VCC, the maximum I can set this to is 8.81, and I'm measuring 8.9 something. And as I turn it down, I'm going to go as far as around 6 volts. When we have 6.09 on the meter, we have 6.15 on the OLED, so that's good. But because this rail is also feeding the 5 volt regulator and the 3.3 as a result, if I move this too low, I'm not able to generate a 5 volt rail anymore, and so this whole Atmel circuit and the display start getting messed up and the readout cannot be trusted anymore. So on that note, with 6.09, 
This is also feeding the negative voltage generator, and we have negative 6.04. And when I go to the maximum 8.81, I get negative 8.75. And then on the multimeter, if I look at the 5 volt rail, 4.98, and the 3.3 .3 is giving me 3.33. So that all looks good so far. The potentiometers are straightforward. We just have the three terminals of the pot wired to a three pin header. So if we need one on a breadboard project, we can just put three or two DuPont cables over to here. I have 20 onboard LEDs, and I chose to use two LED arrays, partly because I'm using up things I've already got on hand. And also, if I use sockets instead of soldering these directly to the board, I can flip them around in either direction and change them from common cathode to common anode by changing the jumper on the common side. And I can also swap these out and change the colors. For the bar graph 20 LEDs, I have it set up for common cathode. So I'm giving plus 5 volts from this DuPont jumper. So I can light them up one by one. Or multiples if I hook up multiple wires. The bi-directional level shifters contain a FET and a pull-up resistor for the low and the high side. There's jumpers here, so I can actually separate these out from the rest of the board. I could change this 3.3 .3 to some other V low. I can change the 5 volts to some other V high. And I can even take the ground away from this board and just connect up a different ground. So I could totally isolate this whole level translator and change the high and low voltage levels within the tolerance of the parts. NXP has an app note that describes how this circuit works. So I'll link to that below. I used a bunch of jumpers here to bring ground, 3.3 and 5 volts. Then I have the high voltage and low voltage end of one level shifter here. With nothing driving either side of the level shifter, the pull-up resistors bring each side to their respective logic high. Right now I have a wire connected to ground. So if I bring ground to one of the inputs, both inputs go low to respond to the logic low. If I release, they will both be pulled high again. If I go to the other level translator input, again, both sides respond going low, and if I release, they go high. Now if I move that jumper to 3.3 volts and connect that to the 3.3 volt side of the level shifter to simulate a logic high in, there's no real change because both sides were already being pulled high. And if I bring 5 volts to the high voltage side of the level shifter to simulate a logic high, nothing really changes again because both sides were already pulled high. This audio mixer and speaker amplifier are very standard traditional circuits. For the speaker amplifier, I'm just using an LM386. There's a potentiometer so we can control the level of the amplifier. The audio mixer part is just a standard inverting summing amplifier op-amp configuration. So you take multiple input voltages, and if you make all of the series resistors here the same, the output voltage is an inverted version of all of these input voltages summed times the gain, which is the feedback resistor divided by whatever value we've chosen to make all of these equal to. I have chosen 10k for all these resistors, including the feedback. And that just means I'm taking up to four input voltages and adding those together. And that gives me an audio mixer that acts as a nice buffer to drive this speaker amplifier. Each input has a potentiometer to ground, so I can control the level of each input. There's a DC block capacitor. And I'm running the op amp on a split supply, so I have plus and minus VCC rails. I didn't really need to use a dual plus and minus supply rail, but I already have a minus and plus VCC rail on this board, so it was just easier to route that supply over. And between the input level controls on the op amp and on the speaker amp, I can just set this so that it's not clipping and distorting and everything will be good. I plugged in this big speaker and a couple of signal generators into the board. So I'll try some simple frequencies on the signal generator.
As usual, all the files are on GitHub, including the KiCad schematic and PCB and Gerber's, a PDF of the schematic and the Arduino code. And I've uploaded the Gerber's as a project on PCB Way. So if you actually wanted to purchase bare PCBs, you could do it directly from PCB Way, and I would get a commission on that. Or you could just get the Gerber's yourself and even modify them and do your own project. Thanks for checking out this project. Thanks to PCB Way for sponsoring this project. Any comments, leave them in the comments section below. See you on the next project.